top guy, like the guy with nothing. <laughs> 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 All right, so I think are we running live now? It's usually about a 10 second delay to go on to YouTube. There you go. You're live now. All righty. Well, welcome everybody. Appreciate you joining us. We are on. We got some special get this is my first live stream to the channel, so I appreciate uh everybody being willing to participate, especially you know, Ian and Brad and Bob and the other special guests that we have joining us. So we'll go ahead and We've got one in the uh, staging area. So we've got Todd. Todd, nice to see you again. Good evening. Hey, Todd. So, Ian, I, I do know, I'll, I'll uh, defer now to you and, and punt the ball to you. I know you were at a B conference here recently, yesterday. Is there anything, you, any updates you'd like to share with uh, your Canadian friends, especially? Yeah, well, I don't know. To be honest, I'm. I'm all be talked out. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I couldn't didn't think that could happen. Did yeah, you tell boy, Sandy? it. it uh, well, she never came with me this time. Uh, she she went. For that. Yeah, yeah, she went down to uh, Texas with her mother and her sister, and then yeah. uh, we're going to New Brunswick at the end of the month. So she figured she'd skip this one out. But uh, yeah, it was a good conference. It was her first Canadian national uh, 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 conference uh, held by the Canadian Honey Council. And I think there was, well, there must have been close to 300 people there, trade show and everything like that. So it, it was well attended. Uh, they also held the CAPA and the CHC annual meetings. So there's a lot of business that uh, took place. And I actually went there basically to talk business than anything else. So I didn't really take in any of the presentations, really. There's some uh, panel discussions they put up front uh, for them. And they just basically... Uh, well, they uh, spoke on, you know, some of the, the hot button topics within our industry. So I got the guys talking a little bit and I they had me speaking on the social media panel right at the end. Uh, so that's the only uh, the only thing I had to do there. But everybody, you know, uh, going to a convention like that, like that is a little bit different than maybe uh, another convention where this one's more business orientated and very issue orientated and study and science and they just jam packed it full of all that so it's very much a commercial beekeeper uh, convention and uh, some of the topics some of the discussions i've had with beekeepers are quite heavy um quite frank uh, but for the most part i, I think uh, speaking to beekeepers the tone is optimistic like even with all these issues and all these problems and challenges we have to deal with there's a lot of optimism and guys are just ready to, you know, take on these challenges and move ahead. Pretty much within all the conversations I uh, took part in, even though they were pretty heated, some of them, uh, there's still that drive of, you know, pursuing the, uh, the opportunity that this business can provide us. So that is very energizing. So I'm, I'm ready to get beekeeping again. I can't wait. So yeah, I had a great time. James was there too. And he picked me up at the airport, so I took him out for a steak supper uh, for that. And then uh, he drove me back to the airport, so really good visit with James. Um, got to know him a little bit better, and then flew home. And actually, my brother, he he flies for Air Canada, and he flew me home on the Airbus 320, so that was kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was a really good trip away, yeah. yeah. But uh, it's, it's in terms of uh, issues or anything... Uh, science and stuff like that. So I can't uh, update anything like that. Yeah. So your brother flew you home on an A320. Uh, yeah. You and 300 of your closest friends. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> we left at eight o'clock and actually uh, those flights are just like a, uh, like the end of the day business. I kind of get back and forth kind of flight they fly. So the flight wasn't actually that busy, but um Nice and comfortable. And he, nice. I, I always joke that, you know, he's going to come into Winnipeg and bounce this all the way in. But he actually painted it down on that runway pretty easy. Yeah. He was sweating <laughs> with the brother in the back. He was like, was I so better make this one work. He had a crosswind <laughs> coming in. He had to fly in like this. I don't know how I do it. I mean, it's just crazy. He's flying in like that. And then they just paint it down on the runway. Just quite nice. amazing. But he had me come in earlier. And uh, I sat just behind the seat as, as Jeff was a captain in the... And the co-pilot there, we're doing all the pre, uh, 
whatever the heck they do. And that's quite, boy, that's impressive. Whew. Yeah. So I, cool. I, I respect him just a little bit more for the amount of stress and <laughs> the work he does every day. <laughs> yeah. Any, yeah. So that's good. Yeah. I had a good time away. Good deal. And safe travels. That's, that's good as well. So, um, I'll get this one started off with the topic of discuss, discussion. And again, thank you all for joining. Uh, in particular, I have a question that centers around the scalability of beekeeping equipment. So my very first, Cayman's very first conference that he had, he held down in, I think it was Lebanon, Tennessee. I was, I was present to that one. Ian, you were on the big screen. You didn't actually make it there, but you gave a presentation. I remember uh, I keep a journal where I, write down all my, my notes from all the beekeeping conferences. And one of your quotes was, I believe, build your bees and buy your equipment yeah, as opposed yeah. to buying your bees. Um, and so not taking loans out there. But my question is this. I started out my very first time I pulled out of a church uh, sanctuary, an old church. So I, I think it's, I think you did basically the same, Ian, maybe, if I remember correctly. from We called it the Holy Hive. I called yeah. it the Holy Hive. Yeah, that one kept me going. Yeah, if it wasn't pastor, for that one, I might not have been beekeeping, actually. <laughs> yeah, my, my pastor called me up. He knew I wanted to get in bees. This is before the days of YouTube. Uh, so it's, you know, 13, 14 years ago. He said, John, we got bees in the attic of the sanctuary if you want to get them. I said, right, well, are you sure they're bees? He said, John, there's honey dripping down the walls. I'm sure they're bees. So I, I had to go on like blog sites and stuff and read how to make a homemade bee vac and all that stuff. And I did that. That was my first one. Been hooked ever since. And so now I'm, I'm running about 30 colonies. But let's let's pretend for a moment that, you know, my uncle Warren Buffett passes away and money's no obstacle. And I can go out and, and go large if I want to. I want to go from 30 colonies to 100. What equipment do I need and in what stages? What What's the order of equipment? I mean, obviously... I could still run 30 hives with a hand crank extractor. I'd have arms the size of Schwarzenegger's maybe, but you know, at what point in time do you go up? I mean, where, where do you go and what's the next step from say 30 colonies to 250 colonies or 300 colonies? What's the order of progression? So I'm, I'm putting the ball to the experts on, on the line. Well, I'd say go do something wise with uncle Warren's money instead of wasting on beekeeping. <laughs> yeah, well, that's cool. point. Yeah, that's very good point. okay not uncle warren it was, it was charlie munger instead but regard regardless you know what what do we do with that in terms of the staging uh that's a really good question that's a really good question and at 100 at 100 colonies we started investing in equipment instead of renting we were renting a honey house and uh so at, at about you, actually, you built a honey house at that point you built a honey house at that point in time randy well we were i wouldn't say built we were wherever we could work carport wherever we could work we do have a honey house right now but uh we were renting a honey house for all he would take 10 percent of the honey and all the cappings and um we were making about eight drums, six to eight drums of honey at the time. But yeah, I guess uh, that would be when in, I in your... set up my honey house was when I went from, uh, I guess, <clears throat> I guess 60 when I, this, this season I graduated from 60 and went to 120 colonies. That's the year that I set up um, what you could call a honey house. Other than that, like before that, it was, dare I say, the kitchen mm. and that and boy that was a lot of work carrying yeah. deep supers into the house and running them through the little nine frame in the kitchen mm. and then i had a 33 frame so, in the honey house the next year yeah looking for, back we were we weren't then, what, what, we weren't a good model what? to follow because we were we were doing we weren't trying to go big we were trying to do everything cheap so we were working outdoors or in a garage with the doors open or whatever not not being mindful of the fact that it's humid the moisture content is going to get high that you're going to have to work on drying it down you're causing yourself extra work and so um you know now we have of course a honey house but we weren't we weren't a good model to follow for that for growth that's a a, a, a 
a recurring number though around 100 colonies i was warned about that when i started beekeeping you know i still had just a few colonies and i talked to anybody who talked to me and and i was mm -hmm. cautioned about 100 and i don't think that the number 100 exactly is the point no, it's somewhere right. around there and the the conundrum with that size was you're not making enough money to afford the equipment that you need to run a hundred colonies, right? Mm. It's more colonies than you can run as a, you know, a smaller kind of uh, operation that doesn't have a lot of equipment. Um, but you have too many colonies to, to, uh, you know, not have machines and, and uh, mm. you know larger extractors and automatic cappers and stuff so you kind of have to make that jump from somewhere under 100 to 150 200 without stopping in between because it's a difficult place to be you don't make enough money to really pay for the equipment that you really do need and so that's the area that i've stopped in so i i usually run between 100 and 150 so you could see how well that advice landed on me and and that's I, I i do know that that's one of my struggles both both economically and uh workflow wise it's difficult for me to justify and and afford the equipment that i really do need to do what i'm doing uh, so there's definitely that so do i you, know do you have an automatic uncapper right now I do, and mostly because I kind of happened across one, and I got it for a really good deal. Um, I, I bought a package of equipment off a sideliner. Um, I guess it would have been in early 2017, and so I got my 33 frame Kelly. I got a sump and a, and a honey pump and my end capper in that package. Otherwise, I don't know that I really would be able to afford one because they're kind of expensive <clears throat> but i'm very glad that i have it it helps me a lot see i did just the opposite i bought way more equipment than i needed as far as extraction and I, i'm willing myself into <laughs> into success <laughs> so uh you know my first extractor was the uh, probably like a lot of people just a it wasn't a hand crank but it was like electric uh, chinesium one right so it didn't take me very long to figure out well wait a minute it only holds four frames and then i have to flip those four frames and i can only uncap four frames so it takes me eight hours to do three boxes of honey right so um the next year i ordered a 30 frame lysen extractor and uh uncapping uh, tank and then the very next year I sold said uncapping tank and bought a new uncapper so I've got the the semi-automatic one right it's not fully automatic you got to crank the handle to crank it through but I'm a one-man operation so I can't physically do more than one thing at a time so I'll uncap 30 frames load up the extractor then while it's spinning I'm uncapping the next 30 frames and it just makes it an easy flow for me. And uh, and I could do a lot more than I'm doing right now. So it just gave me some growth opportunity there. Yeah, for me to answer, John, so, Bob, what I'd have to ask uh, uh, one question. Are we, uh, do we have as much money as as uh, we we want to spend? Or is this something like, or do, or do, do we have a limited budget? We have a limited budget for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's, so, so that's, that's Uncle a bit Warren did not than, pass away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little bit different because if you have an unlimited budget, then I mean, go right to the nines. Like I was at this conference, I was talking to Nate Cohen, and they have equipment, and it is Cadillac, I tell you. And they have equipment staged for every type of beekeeper. You have the 120, which is for the bigger guys, and some of those big guys have three or four of those lines going. And you pull it back to the 60 frame, which maybe suits more of the beekeeper my size, <clears throat> uh, you know, 1,000, 1,500. Actually, I bought that when we had, I think it was 900, 800, 900 colonies. Uh, so you're looking for the mid-range. We're putting through 50 to maybe, uh, uh, well, now we're putting 300,000 pounds through it. Um, and then 
you have the um, capper or the extractor is the 28 frame, which is a little bit smaller scale, maybe more economical for space and such. So, you know, you could, you could buy that thing. And then you have all the supplementary equipment, like the, the sump, or maybe you have a wax press, clarifier, bottling tank, creamer, stuff like that. What I did when I started up, I didn't have any money. When Sandy and I got married, uh, like our farm was no money. We were through the early 2000s, canola and wheat were well below the cost of production. Uh, we went into BSE, just about lost the farm through those years. It was very tough going. And I had the honey farm going just to provide some, you know, living cash just to keep a family. Like we wanted to raise a family. So we had this honey farm going and I was reinvesting into the honey farm as it's going. So it was pretty tight. So the budget wasn't there to be able to spend in, you know, this big honey house or all this fancy equipment. So we bought used and we bought um, whatever whatever used we could get a hold of that would handle the volume of honey that we were pr producing at that time. So I started with that 60 frame uh, or a 36 frame Jones is off the start. And then that got way too small really quick. So then I bought this great big Cowan 250 frame uh, extractor, a dual reel. Uh, it was for dirt cheap, but it was dirt cheap for a reason because it's so damn cumbersome to use. But I was able to put uh, 25,000 and 50,000 and 75,000 pounds of honey through it. And then when I got up to 100,000 pounds, it was almost impossible to keep going without losing production. Like when you get behind in your work, especially out here in the fields, we have canola. And that honey, when you get behind, it plugs up and it starts to harden. And then by the end of the season, you have all these boxes full of hardened honey. And, and you don't make money on that. You lose that, right? Well, it goes back to the bees. You don't really lose it. But you, it's not in the barrel. You can't sell it. So then you start justifying the investment into better equipment. And that's when I bought the 60 frame extractor. So in a lot of ways, um, the, uh, the revenue stream has to dictate how much money you want to pour back into the company. And, you know, you're going to be factoring over a number of years. There's one thing about beekeeping, beekeeping equipment. And you mentioned right off the start, you know, put your money into boxes instead of bees or put your money into equipment because all that's tangible and you can, you can hang on to it and sell it if you want to. And the uh, beekeeping equipment doesn't depreciate for bad at all. Actually, sometimes beekeeping equipment appreciates. I could probably sell my extractor for three times the money I actually bought it for. <laughs> it's just the it's just the way it is. So uh, investment into this kind of equipment isn't like buying a car where it's you know ten years down the line it's going to be worthless. So you factor that cost out a number of years, and you just just hope it works for you. So. That's my answer I, to your question. So I have some I, bottlenecks, and, and my bottlenecks are dictated <laughs> by the fact that I'm a one-man show. Um, and I don't want to discount the fact, and I want to give credit to the fact that my wife does help me from time to time, but she's got a full-time job. So I have to make sure that this <clears throat> that this is done, you know, doable by myself. I can't dictate to her that she has to, you know, get cracking, get to work. Um, but having said that, you know, you can't always... You can't always uh, predict what your bottlenecks are going to be. For example, uh, in the spring, I'm always thinking in the spring, you know, I'm making splits and I'm raising queens and I'm making nukes and I'm thinking, oh, oh man, I'm doing so great at this. I can raise 300 colonies doing this. And then when it comes early September, I'm thinking, yeah, what do you mean I have to feed 100 colonies, treat them, get them ready for winter and do my honey pull and my extraction and everything all at the same time? Well, that's my bottleneck right as far as colony numbers and same in the honey house i've got an old 33 frank kelly the thing is probably as old as i am and the nice thing about it is if anything goes wrong with it it's about 10 seconds until i know exactly what's wrong with it and usually about 10 15 minutes and it's fixed right there's no phoning the manufacturer to get a new module right so I look at that thing sometimes and I think, why well, it's so slow and it's slow to load and unload. And I look at the nice little 28 that Ian was talking about it. Man, that thing looks sexy. And I think if I just had that extractor. Yes, it does. <laughs> but then when, when push comes to shove, I look at my bottlenecks. My extractor is not my bottleneck. So I either deal with my bottleneck or I just... I'm happy with my 33 because it's doing everything I can possibly put through it because it doesn't pace my honey house, right? Because I'm working by myself. So I've got to do everything else too. 
and uh, there's other things that set the pace for the throughput of the honey house. So if I'm not going to address those, there's no good pouring thousands of dollars into a 28 frame cow and you know, <laughs> as nice as that looks. Um, it's it's just deal with like this past summer. Uh, I've I've always had a a bear of a time dealing with cappings and and wax and honey. Separating wax and honey is just just the most difficult thing I think. Um, and and difficulty is either bothersome or expensive. So it'll it'll translate into one of those two things, and maybe portions of both. Um, this year I bought a. Uh, Maxent Senior Spinner, and I kind of went out, went out on a limb, and it was a very, very good price, but still quite expensive, and uh, put that in there, and wow, that's my new favorite piece of equipment right there, hmm. because it has taken so much work off of my back, and it's recovered so much honey for me that I would otherwise per potentially either lose or overheat trying to extract it from the wax. Uh, that it, it was, I mean, it's going to pay for itself either in one to two years, I think, that thing. Um, so it's it's dealing with pain points and bottlenecks, really. I think of Ian every morning I go into my honey house and I skim my sump because <laughs> <laughs> I've heard him speak about his most unfavorite job is skimming the sump. And yeah. I'm standing there skimming the sump thinking about how much Ian hates this job. I don't mind yeah. it so much, but <laughs> <laughs> it just adds like you know an hour in the end of the day going on you know, skin skim the sump, skim the tank, and that's something I never let my employees do because they never knew how to do it properly. There's a you know, we all know how to skim honey, of course, very efficiently, but I hated it because it's that job. So then I uh, that's why I invested into the spinner that I have because I don't have to, everything goes through that and it takes all the honey out. And I don't have to skim any tanks. And that, I, what I should do, Brad, I should take a picture of the, the wax spinner every morning and send it to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll hang Thinking it up over you. myself. I'll hang a picture over myself. <laughs> I too could have a wax spinner. <laughs> but again, you know, because I work myself, uh, that wax spinner, that, that's not cheap. You know, you got heat exchanger, wax spinner, all that kind of stuff. And for me, the throughput probably wouldn't work with that spinner because I wouldn't have enough throughput no. and I wouldn't have enough volume. No, you need volume. To keep that spinner yeah. going. So it wouldn't work for what I'm doing. Uh, the little basket spinner that I'm using uh, actually works pretty darn good. So, Randy, do you have a spinner or Todd or Bob, either one of you? I don't. I don't. We settle everything out in buckets. And I, I thought about buying one, but Mr. Ed has one, and he hasn't used his in a couple of years. He settles everything in buckets. And um, he just recently did a video where he's – it might be on his subscriber side but or his member side, but he's scraping off his, uh, his wax off of his honey that he's let it settle out. And, I, you know, I don't think – and Brad made a good point that some of us, we are the bottleneck and I am, uh, everything we do is manual with the exception of an extractor and an uncapper. And most of the time I'm uncapping manually. So, um, I, it's just, I, it's just time. It's not, it's not labor intensive. It's just time. St stick it in a bucket, let it settle out, scrape the cappings off of it, melt it all out. And, my wife handles all the wax. I don't have to worry about that. But uh, and the, and, and I, I, this I guy's got the pressure. I haven't of... bought a spinner just because Mr. Ed quit using his. I was like, eh, if he's quit using his, yeah. it must just be too labor intensive. I don't know. I don't. I haven't asked him why. Ian's got the pressure of canola honey, so <laughs> the time, you know, you can't just say, "Oh, it's going to take more time," because <laughs> a little bit more time and the honey is gone. Uh, huh. you, know, you can't recover it, or it's a huge job to get that unbunked. Yeah. That's the other thing, too. I, I Once you start anything. hiring, or sorry, Randy stepped on you. Uh, sorry, I don't know anything about canola honey. What's the deal with canola honey? Oh, it hardens. Oh. Yeah. yeah. You, you have a limited amount of time. So if we're too late into the fall, it'll start setting up in the cells, and then we can't pull it out because it granulates. It makes a real good honey. 
but you have to be able to get it out so then you can manage it. Hmm. So that's another thing, you know, once, you know, as I pile on all this workload, the investment into equipment is also, you know, one of the reasons I did that to invest into good equipment is because I'm, I'm starting to hire school kids to help me with all that labor, all the redundant tasks, right? So you want to make sure that the, uh, the facility is set up properly so then you can have people come in and properly help you manage that work. So a little, it takes a bit of an investment to be able to do that. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, John, your question is impossible to answer because there's so many, uh, there's so many, uh, situations you have to consider. Uh, too many variables. <laughs> too many variables. Yeah. yeah. As far as extracting equipment, my general advice would be, and, and I guess because it, it kind of worked for me is, is keep your ear to the ground. Watch, watch the, for sale sites and things like mm -hmm. that and and kind of get an idea of what you're looking for uh the problem with doing it that way is you'll find you'll find this piece of equipment and it'll be a good deal and it'll work for you and then six months later you'll find that piece of equipment and the two don't work together very well you know mm -hmm. they're very good piece of equipment and they do exactly what you need but they don't quite mesh and so sometimes that's a difficulty but um, extracting equipment, def, you know, usually you're not going to lose money on it. If, if it works and you take care of it, it's in decent shape. Uh, if, you, if you outgrow it or you find out, I just need different pieces of equipment because they don't work together anymore, then you can sell that. And you usually won't lose a lot of money on them. So that's my advice on that. Gotcha. Because there's stuff out there all the I, time. I've been, yeah. fantasizing, I've been fantasizing about that 28 frame setup that Cowan's got. The whole package deal it's 44 grand you know but that's a fantasy that's a dream at this point in time it's not it's not reality unfortunately well, we, we're talking but about real we're talking about setting up a second honey house here because uh like i told you we rented one for a long time and so we've talked about setting up a second honey house here at home to uh i mean our, our honey house is only five miles away but if we set up a second one here that we can run as a business to help extract sideliners or small beekeepers that don't have a honey house or don't have the equipment yeah uh it's that's extra money right there that it, there's no labor to it you just be there to man the equipment make sure somebody's not tearing your stuff up yep. and that's the thing so what he was what talking about is having people work for you uh my honey house has got a lot of character uh, I can't really just, <laughs> just turn anybody loose in there because it'll be a disaster what would you charge for something like that, Randy? I'm a sideliner. I'm going to come to your honey house. Well, whenever you charge per frame per pound, whenever we were doing at, at the other honey house, we were, he was getting 10% of the honey and all the wax. And that was the payment. Okay. Yeah. We typically gotcha. charge 35 cents a pound. We keep all the wax. I have neighbors that I will do custom extraction. It's kind of neat. You know, uh, I have the crew going and sometimes uh, we don't have the, well, we have, periods within the week where maybe it's not quite as busy so i can bring in uh, some custom work and it's cash cash is king keep the guys so, busy bit of a cost recapture so 35 cents a pound is about 10 percent. yeah i've had a uh, couple of guys come and get extracting done and i've approached it differently and what i didn't care to take into account was um whether they were giving me full boxes or empty ones you know, because it's really the same wear and tear on my machinery, and I got to lift that frame anyway. I don't, it doesn't matter how much honey is in it. Um, so I charge fifteen dollars a box, and that's oh, you're doing the work. To, it's easy to count, and I'm doing the work. Uh, the, Mr. Roy, Mr. Roy, pull up a chair and sit there and watch you use his equipment. Yeah, he ain't doing yeah, nothing. Yeah. Well, I have one guy that <laughs> oh. does that. And that's a little bit, bit of a different uh, fee schedule, but <laughs> when I do the work, it's. Fifteen dollars a box so far, and don't hold that to me if you're watching this because that price could go up anytime. <laughs> I'll bring you a truckload. <laughs> <laughs> For you folks that are running, uh, that are using five-gallon buckets, I had an issue this year, and the issue is still haunting me. Um, what's your parameters behind what five-gallon buckets you use? And I'll, I'll preface that by saying. I have had three five gallon buckets, food grade buckets that I purchased at Lowe's, one of the big box stores, obviously. 
And my wife comes out and she goes, John, what's all this stuff running over the garage floor? Three five gallon buckets have cracked on the bottom and the I lost bust, all of them. Yeah. yeah. Good the ones. So you, on you guys that's, like that's to say 90 mil? I mean, what, what do you use as your parameters for food grade buckets? I don't know what the, the specs are on mine. I did talk to the representative from the company and, and I really only asked him a couple things and I asked him how, how much I can stack on top. Like if I'm to stack those up, how much uh, weight will they take? And they'll take way more weight than I'm stacking because I'm only stacking three high or four at the most. Uh, and they'll take, I forget what he said, it takes three or 400 pounds each. And so if I'm stacking four high, that's 200 pounds. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, they're just good quality. I've used them for quite a few years now, and I haven't had failures. Knock on and I'm, three. I'm throwing them around at minus 40, too, John. Yeah. I'm yanking them in and out yeah. of my truck at minus 40. So that's actually pretty good pails. Um, I've got great work or uh, great success or luck with uh, tractor supply buckets. The white ones, though. It seemed yeah. like the colored ones, I don't know what it is, if it's red or blue or whatever, they seem thinner. The white ones are thicker. And maybe it's just me. I don't know. But no, that's, I've, I've had the white. same experience. I, I get my own. Bucket for free from uh, from a restaurant, right? So it's a ham local hamburger chain, and their IT guy is one of my honey customers. So he has his restaurant save their pickle buckets, and then I wash them out and air them out, and then that's what gets pump full of honey. What I will say about buckets is I will not use a bucket with a metal handle. All of my buckets have plastic handles. <clears throat> uh, the metal handle buckets that I've had, uh, once you get something heavy like honey in them, the metal will tear out through the plastic and uh, you'll have a disaster. Mm -hmm. So plastic handles, and I was kind of a little tentative with plastic handles because like I say, I haul those things around at minus 40 sometimes. I've grabbed that thing out of my truck by the handle sideways at, at minus 40, and I've never broken a handle. Wow. I've been doing it for a number of years. I've never broken a handle for any reason. I think the main thing that will kill those handles is UV. Yeah. Uh, so if you're using, uh, like my feed pails, for example, they all have metal handles because I think sitting out in the sun like they do, the plastic could deteriorate. But They do. They do. I had an accident with a honey bucket with that. Left them outside, you know, for, I don't know, six months. And then used it the next season. And <laughs> I found out yep. not to do that. I had no idea. And don't don't think you need to fill them up because they're heavy. You know, I think mine filled right up. It'd be nearly 60 pounds. I only run 50 pounds of honey in my pail. Yeah, those pickle buckets... <laughs> The smell doesn't go away quickly at all. <laughs> Luckily, I don't get much honey, and they have plenty of time to air out. <laughs> <Flavor honey. laughs> Pete, Pete loves Firehouse Subs. Firehouse honey. Subs has pickle buckets <laughs> usually stacked up, and every summer he's always bringing me pickle buckets. I'm like, don't bring them things over here; they stink. I can't put nothing in them. They don't. They don't. It takes months for the smell to go away. Good to know. So at what point in time would you guys uh, upgrade to barrels? Or would you upgrade to barrels? If I could lift a full barrel, I might. <laughs> yeah. I, I got nothing to lift a barrel. If I can afford the pump to pump the honey out of the barrel, then I might do that. So I, Just depends I like, who you're selling it to, I guess. Like yeah. uh, your market, uh, some guys only take drums, even uh, uh, quite a few packers. Uh, but there's also packers that you know, just don't have the facility for that. So buyer specific for sure. As long as you've got the equipment to handle them, I like I like drums better. Uh, metal metal drums, not plastic. Because our honey, our yeah. honey crystallizes pretty fast. I don't like heating up plastic. We got to strap our drums and and warm them to decrystallize them. And I just don't I don't like heating. I've I've got some of those bucket warmers from. I don't even remember what the company is, but. I just hate heating up plastic, uh, so I prefer metal drums. I'm actually pushing B made to uh, 
to invest into totes. I think they're three and a half drums in a tote and a lot easier yeah. to maneuver with forklifts and easier to load. I hate drums. Yeah, they're, uh, they're you know, they, they hold quite a bit of honey, but the totes are much easier to, it, so I hope we can do that. Just as a bit of an investment. So it's the next stage of, of uh, honey hauling is everybody seems to be going into a totes. Yeah. And the, you know, the point was made, well, who are you selling it to? And I'm not selling it to them, but um, I use a co-packer that's a very small operation and he has no facility to carry uh, handle drums. So I can't take drums there, even if I wanted to. So my uh, wanting to use pails really meshes well with his need to handle pails. Uh, so, I mean, it's, yeah, pails are what they are. I kind of model my system so that I can, I have little pallets that fit six pails and I can manage them that way. So I'm not really lifting the pails very often. I have my warming cabinet I can load with my tractor yeah. and it, it takes a 600 pound load of honey. So guess what? 600 pounds, that's about a barrel, right? And so then I can unload that in the truck with the tractor off to the packer. Now I have to haul them in there one, one at a time. Uh, or two at a time on a hand truck, but you know, it, it really is dictated by what you have to do with that honey. Yeah, but my fear of uh handling honey and totes is our, our Chinese tallow honey crystallizes pretty fast, and if it crystallizes in a tote, I don't know how to get it out other than to cut the tote open. Yeah, so these ones they're drawing up, they're a very they're not the uh. The, the totes that you think of, it's it's a kind of a as a removable lid, oh, okay. so you can Is get into big, it. Got the big lid on it. Yeah, so you can remove that and get in and wash it if you need to. And there's a valve okay. and clamps down. So, so and they have to be stackable because what a boy they're what's uh, be twenty they'll like be a ton or whatever honey. So and a lot of guys would like to do three top three high. So that bottom tote has to take a lot mm -hmm. of weight. Uh, the ones that BMA have been uh, toying around with the design, I think it's only stackable two, like uh, the double stack, uh, and the guys want to go three. So uh, we're not quite there yet, but uh, we'll see where they go. Yeah, we have we have a little bit left in a tote. Uh, I think it was twenty seven hundred pounds or something like that when it was brought in. And but there, <laughs> there's this much left in the bottom of it, and I've just been nervous that it was going to crystallize because it's got that little small six inch cap or whatever it is on it. If it, if it does, you, I don't know how to get it out other than just cut, cut toad open and go in there with a mix and paddle and, and bust it up. But, um, yeah, to Carrie's comment there, uh, she knows what I, how we feel about happiness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get back to work, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> so what other advice would you give to the sideliners sideliners that want to expand what's your words of wisdom Ooh. make sure you find the room before you start making decisions yeah. it's more yeah. land more storage whatever it is yeah. it's different for everybody it's yeah, different for like What'd buying the 30 frame extractor and having to remove the door frame to get it in that type of <laughs> measurement. Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> Just, thanks for the heads up. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, Randy. It, 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 it is different for, for, I mean, you know, and location. Yeah. I mean, you look at this backyard, right? Um, I have different storage needs, right? Mm -hmm. Than, than Randy might, because, um, you know, maybe Randy can put some of his stuff in a sea can in the backyard and whatnot. It's mm -hmm. just fine. And maybe there's some stuff I can't because it's going to freeze solid. And, and this, whatever I'm trying to put in there, can't freeze. So that's mm -hmm. a different problem. So so there are different problems for everybody. I, I don't know if I can advise how to expand from sideliner to, you know, or from, you know, hobby or large hobby to sideliner or whatnot, because you know, it was Bob was talking about earlier, my situation was a little different. I didn't have a day job. I had some money saved up, but I didn't have the day job to support 
you know, buying equipment and whatnot. And so I had to say, well, what do I need to, what are my goals? What do I think I want to do? And then what do I need to do that? Um, I also had a leg up where I had some land, I had some equipment, I had a tractor, trailers, trucks, I had buildings. So I had a real head start in a lot of ways uh, in that regard. So again, my situation is is different. I think one of the the most important things I did early on when I started bees my first year, my beehive equipment was just like your regular standard everyday hobby, you know, single bottom board sitting on a pallet in the backyard with a telescoping cover and and all you know the whole thing. And after that summer, um, I had to decide, okay, what am I going to do? And because I couldn't imagine running, and I didn't know how many I could run, but I couldn't imagine running 100 or 200 colonies like that. Uh, so I started doing some research online to see what people were doing. And I found this guy who was running a fairly good size operation, which was probably, it seemed to be about 10 times the size of what I wanted to run. And uh, he was running, he was running a little two-way pallet that, you know, I looked at that thing and I thought, you know, I think that would work for me because I have my little tractor and it would handle those two-way pallets just fine. My tractor won't lift a whole lot. Like I say, it won't lift a barrel. So, you know, 500 pounds or so is about all we're looking at. So I couldn't use a four-way. It wouldn't handle those very well. And uh, so I took that idea and I modified it a little bit with some ideas I had uh, set set to work in my wood shop and I built myself a whole whack of two-way pallets my first year and migratory covers as well to go with them um, and I'm so glad I did that that I didn't wait until I had a hundred colonies to switch over to a different system because you know I'm just locked in now to my system and it's been working really really well for me one thing john that, that i'd like to say to that is um i'm an industry guy so i would advise beekeepers who are you know wanting to expand to join your local association or find a bee club club or if you don't want to join them go to these uh conventions that they hold get a non-member ticket or whatever just go there and be exposed to the in issues of the day and see all the science being presented and mingle with the beekeepers there and just absorb it all because that exposure now youtube's good like this is something i didn't have when i developed my business i didn't have this constant source of information but you want to go to uh you want to go to these associations because they're more um they're local and they're regional and you can tap into these guys and you start forming networks and by forming these networks you can you know establish business connections with guys within the area to help you develop that business or fi find that support uh, structure to build and manage mm -hmm. your business so it's very important like I would just come back from this uh, conference like you asked me right off the top there and I talked to guys for two days straight in the hall and they're I mean, I'm not going to tell you what we talked about, but I've, I've come back with nuggets of gold that I'm going to be applying in my operation this year. And you don't get that unless you go out there and expose yourself to the conversation, right? So that would be my advice, just to, just to engage. But I would also strongly suggest to join your associations, support the efforts, because those are the guys that are putting the time in to be able to help everybody else. So like You look at Brad here. I mean, he's a director of the Manitoba Beekeepers Association. Uh, how many years have you been on, Brad? Must be nine years. Hundred. Hundred years. <laughs> well, it only seems that way. Uh, I seven, think it's uh, in the... seven, 2017, I, it was my first. Year. Yeah, I come on in eighteen. That's right. And yeah, so Brad has been on the NBA for such a long time. That's our provincial beekeepers association. And now Brad is the president of the Red River Apiarist Association, which is a regional group. Uh, um, it, it, guys like Brad pour their energy into our industry to help uh, to basically because we want to help beekeepers and we want we 
I care so much about our industry. We want to, you know, make it better for everybody just to help people along. So this is where you find your gold. This is where you find all your, your advice and the people that's going to help you. These guys are there to help you. So I would tr strongly suggest to tap into those sources. Good Which nice. reminds me, I got to buy Carrie's ticket for our convention. <laughs> <laughs> I better do that first thing tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah strongly said, that's one thing. Uh, I, I, that's one thing. Or sorry, I stepped in here again. Right, right, right. Uh, but I'm noticing that employers are also uh, sending their employees to these conventions too to, to, to submerge them into you know all this also just to help them become more familiar with what's going on uh, it's kind of like a learning process right so yeah, go ahead randy sorry no i was just gonna say i was kind of piggybacking on what you said i strongly recommend that people network through these organizations and and beekeepers clubs anything else i you know with us we know anybody in the industry around here so there's nothing that there's no point that we come across something that we need that we can't have that we can't get or have access to. And that's just, that's just a matter of uh, networking, making friends, making connections. And so anytime I need, if I need a hundred Queens next month, I can go get a hundred Queens next month. I, I know exactly where to go to get them. And, um, I, you know, if you don't, if you don't show up to these kind of events or these meetings or, or meet people, you're stuck. Yeah. And surround yourself with people who share your goals and objectives. Um, surround yourself with people who look like you want to be. Um, have good relations with those who you agree with. And make sure you also interface with people who disagree with you. Because that'll keep you on your toes. And that'll make you... Uh, question things and look at the other side of issues and make sure you're not shouting into an echo chamber all the time because yeah. if you're just talking to people who agree with you that's not going anywhere well i'm married to one of those brad <laughs> no, no. All of a sudden, your screen goes black. We lost it, John. Where'd you go? John? John? <laughs> no, she, she keeps me in check. She keeps me grounded. That's for sure. Good. Yeah, you were you were looking for a next no, step, I and I I think really that varies so widely because it really depends on are you doing. What what are your goals? Are you trying to do crop pollinations? Are you trying to raise bees? Are you trying to raise queens? Are you trying to make honey? I don't even you know. There's so many things you can do with it. So many so many different ways you can go with beekeeping that it's hard to to lay out a business plan that everybody's going to follow. I was yeah, talking I, I with a guy at the conference. Right, sorry, I've stepped back again. I must, I must have a delay here. But um, at the conference, I was talking to a fellow, and he was a, uh, a weatherman, and she was uh, she she was involved with the media also somehow, so they're both media people, and they got tired of that. So they they had some farming in their background, so they're familiar with farming and everything. But he went and he bought nine hundred hives, and uh, and he had a he, actually what he did he bought a retired farmer's uh, apiary. We still had some equipment, but it didn't have the bees, and he bought 900 hives in to hive them. And there's two employees that come with the deal, and he become a beekeeper, just like that. <laughs> School of hard knocks, and he—that's what he did. He went to associations. He reached out to his neighbors. He did every. He studied. He did everything he could to be able to get the upper edge to make this thing work. And he's 4,000 hives. Uh, hmm. Had a last couple of years are kind of tough, just because it's been the weather's been really crazy up here. But uh, other than that, they seem to be doing very well. So there is no template, you know. It's you know this that's one of the interesting things about the beekeeping in industry is you can get into it in a very you know whatever way you want to get into it, and a lot of people have access to be able to get into it because it's a very low investment opportunity. Whereas like grain farming, you need twenty million dollars to get in. It's, it's so that just it turns it into a generational um, a business. Or beekeeping, you know, you buy four colonies, just keep reinvesting, and you end up with a thousand, right? So, make it what you want it. Okay, good. 
back to that equipment thing. This is exactly two cents, my two cents. Not, I mean, my, <laughs> my experience is it kind of tags on what Brad said. There is, um, get down what you want to use as equipment, as far as, you know, like bottom boards and stuff like that. And as you grow, just standardize that equipment as much as you can, because once you get 50, 70, a hundred colonies, if you change the entrance reducer, you're spending, you know, you're spending several hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, you know, you change the bottom boards, $3,000 just to swap them all out. So uh, I think the, the more that you can standardize, standardize that up front, the, the less overall expense you'll have in the long run. And I mean, that's, ask me how I know. <laughs> well, I agree. Standardization is, is key, especially in hive equipment. Boy, there's nothing like having this hive that needs some special thing because it's a little bit different than the other hundred hives you have. You got to go chasing a special feeder or something because this one's different. Boy, that's a big time waster. And to me, one of the biggest challenges in my summer is not the beekeeping so much. I mean, that's challenging enough. Keep these bugs alive. It's very challenging. But is figuring out those ways to save that one step. If I can save that one minute on whatever I need to do, I've saved myself two hours a day, right? Uh, one step. I've saved myself 200 steps a day. And the boy, that adds up, especially when you're old like me. <laughs> you get to the end of your day and you just can't take those extra 200 steps. Um, and every time you can save that accumulation of steps, you can add one more colony because now you're more efficient, right? When I first started keeping bees, I'd go out and I'd work my 10 colonies. I couldn't even stand up anymore. It was terrible. Well, now I'll go out and work a hundred and yeah, I'm kind of tired, but I do it. So it's, it's mostly just getting into that groove of efficiency and, uh, you know, work out little things, little things. Um, here's a little thing. I go to my out yard and my out yard has 32 colonies because that's how big my trailer is. And I take my truck out there and I have 32 honey supers because I'm going to go super my yard. I have 32 honey supers. So I park my truck at the end and I have to carry them all the way down the line because all my hives are all in a line. So I grab two honey supers, one in each hand, and I walk to the end of the line and I set them down. And I walk back and I get two more and I walk to the second to the end of the line and set them down. Why is that? Because by the time I'm done going all the way down and back again, when I'm tired, I only have to walk to the first one. <laughs> right. And now I can go and set all the honey supers on and I don't have to carry them anymore mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm already used up some of my gas. Right. So now I can just take a lid off, put the box on, put the lid on take a lid off, put the box on, put the lid on. And not only that, but I don't set the two honey supers that I take first at the end. I set them second to the end because then I can take a lid off, grab a honey super and put it on, put the lid on. And I just leapfrog all the way down the line, right? Little, little things thinking about that. And that saves me enough energy and enough time that then I can add that extra colony. I can run that extra pallet of bees or that extra 10 or 20 colonies of bees, right? It's it's not that my way button honey supers is the only way or it's the most genius way. It's an illustration of a couple of minutes of thinking about it saves me time and energy enough to actually carry on with my day and do more work that day instead of working a little bit harder, taking a little more time and not getting as much done that day. It's kind of funny you mentioned that, Brad, because uh, I'm the same way. We, we measure out the steps in the yard, and I'm like, we manage the kids. Like, at, they, they're they very efficient. They go this way, they're carrying something. They go that way, they carry something. They go that way, they do something. They go this way, they do something. Everything is working in the system. 
and I, well, I, how many commercial beekeepers will be on this? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some big commercial beekeepers, their strategy goes completely away from that. What they do is they invest a lot of guys, a lot of guys, and they yeah. just throw them into a yard. And these guys, they go, they carry a box. And they go set it down on the ground. Then they'll go over here and carry a box. And they'll come back over here to carry this box. And they'll carry it back over to just about five feet away. And then they'll go over there for something. They'll go pick that box and carry it. Then they'll stack it five tall. And then they'll unstack. And then they'll put it on the colony. It's just, yeah. it's just yeah. makes me so, it's just painful to watch yeah, <laughs> for yeah, me. Yeah. This steps yeah. out every single yeah. work duty we have. And these guys are just like bees in a hive. They're just doing little things all over the place, right? So two completely, totally different strategies. But they get the work done very quickly for them by just throwing a bunch of guys at the job. It's really yeah. neat to see that. And, that. and that's an approach. And if that works for them, God bless them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know I'm, and and I, it doesn't take me long to, to train my crew either. <laughs> yeah. All I have to do is decide how I'm going to do it. Then the, yeah. crew, the crew is trained just like that. Right? Your, your crew is a stubborn bugger, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was I was kidding, sitting with some 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 seniors one day, and and they were asking me about that, and I said a uh, little funny story, and I I said yeah, I said my boss is a real hard ass, and they laughed and laughed, and I said yeah, but don't tell anybody, I'm sleeping with his wife. <laughs> 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 but you know another little thing about that i watch youtube you know beekeepers like probably we all do kind of kind of drives me nuts when i see the lid comes off and it boom it goes that way and this piece of equipment and boom it goes that way and and then now we're tripping on things we're walking around stuff and we don't know where it is when we go to a dive but you know i'm going to be doing 50 or 100 hives the lid comes off the same way and it goes in exactly the same spot, leaned up against the hive so I don't have to get to the ground to get it and I don't have to step on it and I don't have to walk around it, right? And and when I'm done working that hive, I don't even have to look to see where the lid is. I'll reach down and it's right there. So just little things like that that just save that extra step. And it sounds weird, but when you start working the, hi the number of hives that I think you want to work, John, those little things are gold, I think. Yeah. How many hives do you have, John? Thirty right now. Oh yeah. So not enough. Too much at times, but not enough at other times, right? Enough that you could get yourself in trouble pretty fast if you started growing that. Yep. Brad, the only thing you're missing there is those lid tossers generate comments which drive which attract the algorithm to grow your channel. <laughs> <laughs> So why do you think my start. yeah? Why do you think my truck still got a busted windshield? You wouldn't believe the comments. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's making things clear now. I can, I can, you know, there's a bunch of stuff now that makes sense. Yeah. I wondered about that, but I never commented, Randy. So you know, I, yeah. like you know, he didn't ever find his hive tool or keep his smoker lit <laughs> it's all about the algorithm <laughs> i was just going to change my video's intro music to the sanford and sun theme bum, 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 bum. when you go through the yard so much stuff laying around everywhere yeah the the europeans really hate that windshield i get the i get the constant comment your windscreen is broken sir and i'm like yeah, well, it's not it's not even in my line of sight so I ain't thank you for it. your contribution <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so john i don't think we really covered like uh maybe i was sleeping um like, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? How many do you want to keep? And like, what's your, you what's know, the point? You want to quit the day job and go full-time bees? Like what's going on? I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I'm still trying to figure that one out. You know, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll see. I, mean, I was talking to one beekeeper, a uh, commercial beekeeper, not long ago. Well, I was at the, at the conference um, in uh, Louisville and he's from Indiana. He provided a lot of, a lot of information there. And um, basically by the time I'm I'm going to be financially stable enough to go full time, I will no longer be healthy enough to go full time. So I I don't know you know what that looks like. 
I think my goal would be to go to 100. Will I ever go past 100? I don't know. Probably not, but we'll see. I don't want to quit my day job. At least not yet. If you can do 100, you can do 150. If you can do 150, <laughs> you can do 200. Well, that's kind of what we talked yeah, about there before, we go. right? Well, because I don't know. two is twice as many as one, but you know, ten isn't is only twice as many as two, right? That's kind of the way it works. My beasts have kind of told me that I can only do seventeen because 17. every year that's what I have when I go out in the spring. It seems like seventeen. I could have a hundred and fifty in the yard in winter, going into winter. And 17 come out in the spring. It just, that's the number. And it's so. kind of a self regulating thing, too. Um, you know, I was doing great last summer. I got behind in my work last fall, and some things didn't get done. And I think I'm going to get my wrists slapped this spring because of, because of that. So it's kind of, kind of rates itself, sort of thing. And I didn't know. So, Ahead, so DC's bees brought this up earlier, but uh, how are you guys looking for winter losses? I'm about 50% myself right now. 50? Yeah, winter's not done yet. We've got a lot of winter yet. I can't see most of my bees, so. I'm at 38%. I think for the heavy work, as far as an, an investment in equipment, you may already have it, but. A little tractor, about the size of what Brad has, or maybe a little bigger. It's something you can you can handle drum honey with it, and you can you can uh, prep yards with it. Uh, you can handle the heavy work. You can move your pallets around if you're palletizing. That that just saves so much backbreaking labor. Uh, you're, you're not having to go out and, I mean, you, you do have to weed eat some yards, but you can go out and clear a spot and lay out lay out your equipment. Uh, you can. We we have a drum lift and we use a front end loader and we just lift it up on the back of a truck, move drums around. Anything that it's is in a drum, we use those little Home Depot furniture dollies to move them around the honey house. But a little tractor probably to me is worth more than anything else to start with. If you're going if you're going big enough to be hand, handling stuff, tractors are kind of weird because they're they'll do almost anything. Right, but mm. they do everything pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, it's kind of like a Swiss Army knife. Um, yeah. It, it'll it'll do almost anything for you, but sometimes not really the best. Mm. Uh, and and you're you're right. I I often wish I had a little bit bigger tractor, but if I had one, I wouldn't get rid of the one I have because it's small enough that it will do those mm. small, confined jobs. I can drive around my apiary and mow the grass with that thing. Right. Mm -hmm and move hives at the same time i'll move the hive mow the grass and then move the hive back <laughs> you know yeah. without leaving a seat <laughs> that, that's on the wish list that's coming soon the tractor and, and my wife has already approved that one so i'm, I'm good there i'm golden <laughs> right on <clears throat> the did, did you over. Yeah, get her to approve a Hummer B or, or something like that. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> well, I think, you know, when you're talking about um, ha having enough money to get to the point to where, you know, making the bees sustainable and enough money to do it, right? So it gets to that point to where, you know, Ian, what'd your dad say? either do it or don't right mm -hmm. so that's it gets to that point that's that's what he said he did do you want me to tell you exactly how he says it because i always uh make it pg for everybody <laughs> <laughs> the uh i don't mind you can tell me exactly how i know i'm, I'm pretty sure i know how he said <laughs> But I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's a scary thing, right? Because you you're leaving something you know every two weeks or every week. You you've got that influx of cash, and it's it's like putting all on black, right? At the you you're when you're stepping out of that comfort zone and saying, "Hey, let's do this," and then you know you're waiting, right, Brad? 
you're doing work now for six months from now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sometimes a year. Right. But that's farming, right? You, you work for a year before you see that paycheck sometimes. Um, and sometimes it's a week and sometimes it's a month or six months. Um, but you'll need the money down the road just as much as you need it today. That's what I always say. So, you know, don't spend it, tomorrow's money. I just hope it trickles in fast enough for me to use it. Yeah. 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 Got to pay the bills for sure. But you got to fish or cut bait, right? Yep. You just got to do it. You, you can't piss around. You just got to do it. Yeah, and taking on the opportunity. Bees are opportunists in a lot of ways. And I think beekeepers are much the same way. I mean, we're just taking what they produce, right? So, but the way I look at it is I, I set the plate every year and then I just take whatever they provide and uh, always ready to be able to capitalize, right? They're always ready for that opportunity. So if you, like, you, you, you got to look for those opportunities. What are you going to be able to capitalize on further down the line? And make sure you set the th your business up to be able to pounce on it when it comes. Because it's, it's not going to come every year. Sometimes it won't come for five years, but you're waiting for it. And when it comes, shoop, you can bring it in and take it. Like right now, we, we're just getting things lined up uh, to be able to capitalize, not this year, but the next year after that, because there's opportunity lurking. And if it works out, I can make a lot of money. It might not, you know, I put a lot of work into something that maybe doesn't work. But it could work out, and I could make a lot of money doing that. So you know, we're just 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 setting that plate and just ready to eat it all the time. So, uh, what's what kind of opportunity do you have, John, in your area to be able to capitalize on? What where's the opportunity there? Honey sales are pretty good right now. Now I'm not retailing. You know, right right now I'm just a home based vendor by Indiana law. That's where I'm located. So I can't retail, can't wholesale yet. Um, I'm working on that. That's the that's one of the why I want to make some of these investments. If I get the, the processing area inspected, government inspected, then I can actually, you know, wholesale retail. But uh, right now, I mean, I, I can't I sell all my honey every year. I just and I don't advertise. People knock on my door and they, they come by. They want to get it. They shoot me a text. Hey, John, I want some honey. OK, I got it. You know, we're good. So right what, now I'm, what are I'm selling out any advertising. What are your limitations that, right? on that? What are your limitations on that? Does the state limit the amount of honey you can sell directly, or is there any limitations uh, on that? Possibly, but I don't know what those rules are. So I, yeah, I, it's I don't know. Everywhere. Yeah, there's there's no real big limitations on me doing that. Uh, it's just kind of whatever I can sell, and that's that's definitely the best way if you can move the product. Mm -hmm. That's your best margins and whatnot, but it can be the most work too. You know, I sell retail yeah. as well, and the margins aren't nearly as good, but it's way less work and get exposure that way too. That's but another thing. We, we don't go to. That's go another thing. We're rent, renting a honey house. If you have, if you're in a place where you have to be inspected, you have to have a, a honey house to do it. You don't have to come up with eight or ten or twelve grand to build a honey house. You can rent one fairly reasonably. You know. I'm considering, I guess, brainstorming, and this is what's kind of sparked this conversation. We're considering making a heavy investment into our honey house, so I would be inspected, and I could also then, you know, rent that out to other other local beekeepers as needed. So mm -hmm. that's something that I kind of have in the back of my mind, which kind of brought this conversation on. So, you know, what do I need as part of that honey house? I understand the inspection laws, so that I don't need that, but just the, if we were building a honey house to rent out what, what equipment should I include in that? What's not necessary? You know, I don't think I need barrels to do that, but that's what sanitary. I'm like that's the basic thing that they're looking for is uh, keeping the place clean. So you're going to want water, preferably hot water, and you're going to want floor drains. Uh, you're right, going to yeah. want some way to get that wash water out of the floor drain out of the facility. So likely a septic tank or something like that. Uh, they're likely go if you have employees and they're going to likely want to see more of an elaborate layout where you have like a, an employee room uh, with, with a washroom. So it can get very costly when you start looking at that side of it. But basically look at the structure and look at how you can wash down the structure before you consider anything else, because that's basically what they look for. If you can keep the place clean and then you follow up with uh, programs and that just to prove that you're keeping it clean. 
And windows that open at the top, that has nothing to do with the inspector. That's just <laughs> letting the bees out because you're going to have bees hanging out in there for sure. <laughs> you're going to have bees. For sure. Yeah. yeah you're, there's definitely a market in my area for custom extracting and honey house rental for sure. Big downside there, of course, in, in our uh, season is everybody wants to extract at the same time because just the way our season is, it's everything happens at the same time and it happens fast. I tell so, you the one, the one piece of equipment that we have that's kind of unusual, I guess, is we have an old 80 gallon, uh, Walter Kelly settling tank with a mixing paddle in it. And that thing is invaluable for drying down honey. It's a, a jacketed heated tank with a mixing paddle in it. And, uh, we use that a lot. We use that as much as anything else in the play, but our, you know, our humidity is high down here. Moisture content on our honey is fairly high sometimes when we pull it, so we use that thing a lot. And so you use that for drying down honey in the building? Yeah. Bring the RH down in the building and just run it? Yeah, you don't even have to do that, really. You can leave the – you don't even have to turn the air on or anything. You just run it as long as you, you know, bring, bring the temperature up to about 100 degrees, run it. It runs about 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, off for 45, 15 off for 45, and you can dry it down uh, about – a percent and a half, two percent in a week. Nice. Wow. I That's run good. my honey house when I'm extracting my honey house and, and hot room or one one building, and I run that at fifty percent uh, humidity, and like it'll get very humid in there because there's a lot of wash water and open honey and everything, so um, it runs constant and it's a it's a fairly big humidifier too. It it, it yeah. pulls air. Uh, water out really fast but i'll run it at 50 percent because that uh, equates to about an 18 percent uh, moisture yeah. in the honey so it'll just by nature uh over time especially the the honey in the comb that dries pretty fast yeah. in a appropriate environment if we if we had a smaller build in our honey houses in a 2000 square foot building so to run dehumidifiers and all that doesn't it's not really effective there but uh and, and ian's probably going you're trying to 80 80 gallons at a time golly <laughs> well, that's a pretty big tank but we use that a lot <laughs> yeah yeah mine's mine's uh what is about 800 square feet or something um and that's another piece of equipment that was you know it was a little bit of money and a couple grand for that dehumidifier and those things mm. are not cheap but boy am i glad i pulled the pin on buying that that thing just is just amazing. It'll mm -hmm. pull 19 gallons of water a day out of the air. Wow, it's just incredible. Mm. Uh, so, so it's no problem. I can set that at 50, and it just keeps that building rock solid 50 percent the whole time. You can't stay in there too long, can you? <laughs> <laughs> well, but before I bought it, because I run at 30 C, <laughs> which is, which is, what is that in F 30 30 C? That's got to be. Like maybe. Uh, and but it's uh, more like ninety, maybe. But it doesn't matter. Yeah, forty is a hundred. Eighty-six. So anyway, eighty-six. Okay, so it's eighty-six F in there uh, because again, my hot room and my extracting facility is same room, right? So I have to run it pretty warm. Uh, so eighty-six F, and yeah, before I had the dehumidifier, oh man was it brutal working in there because it, it, it'd it be 90 percent humidity in mm. there and for a canadian we melt about 78 degrees so <laughs> you know that was really hot <laughs> but bring that down to 50 and it's completely workable now i can spend all day in there without perishing mm. however i'm going to go up there and be a bobsicle yeah we'll bring the cold weather for bob <laughs> It better be cold when you're up here. We're talking about cold weather all the time. You come up here, it's nice and balmy. You'd be like, you guys are bullshitting us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could have worked it's a, bit, it's a bit colder now. It's getting cooler, so maybe it, the cold weather might stay till the end of the month. It's hey, 70, gears. 70 degrees down here right now. It's uh, 35 where I'm at hmm. right now. We got a question in the chat that I thought I'd bring up. I've got a question. Can you overfeed with sugar bricks this time of year in Kentucky? What's your opinion? 
I don't think so yeah. personally. I think if they if something natural comes in, they're just going to stop eating the sugar brick. Mm -hmm. Then you pull them off and throw them in a bucket and add some water to it, and now they got some feed. That's I mean that's been my experience. Where, where I'm at in Indiana, if I if I would go out on a nice warm day, 40, 50 degrees right now, if I if I get that opportunity, pop the lid. If they're low, I'll put some sugar in there. Um, it probably won't be a block. It'd probably just be granulated sugar just to feed them. I mean, I'd rather have them have something instead of starving to death. But I'd rather, you know, have nature take its course, obviously. Yeah. Well, apparently the Super Bowl is going to overtime. That's too oh, bad. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I think you guys, uh, and 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 I think everybody here is in the you guys club except Ian and I. Um, you know, people talk about Canada being so cold and they think, well, how do you keep bees? How do you winter bees, you know, in such an inhospitable environment? I think we got it easy. I think you fellas in the warmer climates, that seems to be tough, tough business to keep those bees all winter because your your temperatures are always hovering around that that clustering point, right? You'll go down mm -hmm. below cluster, you'll go above cluster, you go down. But here it's just like below, done. Like they're just clustered for five months and then they wake up. There's only two or three weeks out of a year that our bees aren't flying some. Yeah, it's got to be tough. Can't imagine that. So, Randy, are you on the coast? Yeah. Yeah. I'm can, can you? Fifteen minutes the from ever, the from the beach. Okay. Do the, the bees ever stop? I mean, can can you actually? Can you be grafting all year round, for example? No. No. I mean, you can, okay. but you're not going to have, you're not going to get any mating. There's no drones. Okay. That's why I wasn't aware of. I didn't know if it was warm enough. You had drones year round or not. No, no. Uh, starting okay. maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll be seeing I've, people start, people start grafting down here in a couple of weeks. I've got drone brood, but they haven't hatched out yet. Right. So that's kind yeah. of where we're at. Yeah, you can graft all you want, but you can't get ahead of nature because if you, I mean, you can make queens, but you're not going to get them mated. Uh, I don't know that, and, and in the wintertime, they're probably not going to tend them anyway. They're just going to let them, let them die. Got it. They don't, they don't need them. They can't do anything with them. Maybe you could, maybe you could make some virgins, but you're not going to mate them unless you're doing uh, artificial insemination. Okay. Didn't know how that worked down in the yeah. southern parts. We'll start seeing yep. swarms here in the next couple of weeks. I got to run, guys. Have a good evening. Hey, right, thanks, Ian. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thanks for coming in. You know, swarms in the next, next couple of weeks. Yeah. There's uh, somebody already caught a – oh, uh, Bruce. Bruce's bees caught a swarm. I think it was off of his bees, but he caught a swarm this week. He's in wow. he's in southern Alabama. Yeah. Good, Todd. You're going to say something? Uh, I was going to go back to the drone thing. So it's not always a even at middle of the year. It's not always a given, uh, at least where I live. So this year, uh, I discovered. Though probably two weeks, a week and a half ago, I, I had 20 hives that just gone. And most of them were, were uh, just colonies that faded away, meaning a queen failure. And I wrote stuff down. So taking notes is a pain in the butt, but it can help you. And in my situation, all of the, uh, all of the queens that I grafted on June 24th, uh, were the, were these hives that died? So I think there's something you know, as far as the drone supply in my area. You know, something. It's mm -hmm. it's just kind of odd that all those queens mm -hmm. that that did disappear on me this year, or or colonies, uh, came from queens that were made at the at the same time. So I'm just like kind of later thinking, in later matings. 
Yeah. So I think that at least for me, and it might be Bob's situation too, the, the, the drone population isn't as healthy mm. in, in my area. So, or they just had bad matings. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't know, but uh, they're not I'm pretty sure I'm producing all of the drones and all of the mating, right? It's not too many like wild colonies. And if they are wild colonies, it's because they were my bees last year or the year before, right? <laughs> I, I'm like uh, populating the whole neighborhood. Yeah, I've gotten yeah, to where know, It's not always a, you know, it's not always a guaranteed thing. So you have to make sure um, if you do do your, your, your grafting, I'm not saying that you need to do it, but it might be a good idea to write some notes down, some dates, just and shove it away. And in my case, I would have never looked at it if I didn't have 20 losses and because it just kind of bothered me. And I, it was in an area where I, I knew I was adding on colonies at the end of the rows. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so that's how I determined. Well, that's what I'm thinking happened. So, uh, hmm. yeah, it's just something to keep that's in good. mind sometimes. Yeah. That's good taking notes like that. That's, that's a good observation. And, and they're just very, you know, simple notes nothing nothing elaborate at all especially for me yeah. i quit taking notes after school ended for me so that <laughs> i don't do that much anymore i've i've got i've gotten to where i've tracked my mating uh success on different yards and i know what yards don't mate well um uh, so the the my best queens come off of three yards and I don't know if that's because we've run bees there so long that there's enough, we've lost enough swarms that there's enough feral colonies around with throwing off ton, tons of drones or whatever. But um, yeah, I know, I know which yards are going to make well this, my home yard uh, this past year we ran uh, first round was 47 Queens on this yard. 100% got mated and started laying and uh, unheard of hundred <laughs> percent seven of them uh seven of them superseded but I, but out of that first round 100 percent got made it and started laying nice. and i was just i was just blown away i didn't expect that because uh, i had on another yard i had 50 percent uh, and i was like man that's just that's crazy and they're only three three miles apart yeah there's you could go into all kinds of things with uh with grafting I, yeah yeah. For example, you know what? La my first round last year, I had 48 cells. And um, uh, boy, you better have those timed right because if you don't, and I found out the hard way, I must have picked a larva that was a day or so older that slipped by me. Mm. And uh, I went in, I, I went, I remember it because I came home from work on a Thursday evening and I went out there and I looked at them. Okay. Got everything set up because I was going to go out there Saturday morning and get them and put them in the incubator. I pull the frame up and all of them are all torn down ex except for one where she actually hatched out. And then I tore that high part. <laughs> oh, I was pissed. But it, you know, well, so 47 queens gone. Yeah. Wow. It's good practice That's round. Yeah, that, yeah, it was practice. Yeah. That's the beauty of an incubator, my friend. <laughs> See, you shot I, pushed it. I, I really pushed it. So, you shot yeah. 47 under par. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was good. pushing my luck. <laughs> the, uh, well, this has been a beekeeping day for me since I woke up this morning, so... I'm yeah. probably going to call it an evening myself, gentlemen. Uh, I appreciate the invite, John. That sounds good. And uh, Yeah, thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. If, no problem. You guys have a good one, and I'll talk to you all on the next one. Nice to Let see you, Bob. Hey, Bob. Thank yep. you. Good night. And I'm I'm on the Eastern time zone, so it's getting late for, for this guy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's if cool. anybody's got anything you want to bring up real quick, we're, I'm happy to stick around a little bit longer, but if not – we can have some more fun later on some other time. All I yeah. have, Randy, is is uh, I'm number 45, so just remember that. You're what? Number remember four. in the comment in the YouTube comments from your last video, I said 45. Yeah. And when you 
when you said, what do you mean? And I thought, oh, crap, why did I write that? Then I then I realized after a while, oh, I was the 40, uh, 40. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was 945, wasn't it? No, it was 45. 45. Wait, yeah, it was right. Yeah, it was It was 945. Yeah. It was 945, and I'm like, what the heck does that even mean? Am I missing <laughs> something? I don't even know. I don't know what 945 is supposed to be. <laughs> well, guys, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate all the advice, and I'm sure I'll be reaching out Welcome. again, but we'll see yeah, what this, you, where this B adventure takes me. Thanks for thanks the invite. For I enjoyed you. hanging out with you guys. Yeah. Hey, glad you're here. Much better right, than the we'll Super Bowl. We'll see everybody. Good night, everybody. Yes, absolutely. It nice was. seeing you all. <laughs> we'll see you. Thanks so much. All see right. you later.